Hi everyone, welcome to Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska, and welcome to this play-by-play -play broadcast brought to you by Explore.org, the Katmai Conservancy, and Katmai National Park. My name is Mike Fitz with Explore.org, and joining me is my co-host today, uh, Ranger Chris Kleesrath from Katmai National Park. Uh, Ranger Chris, great to have you along once again. Well, thanks for asking me. I've been looking forward all day to talk about bears. Looks like we have a bunch of the falls and uh, lots of fish downstream. So I think we have some things to talk about. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's it's continuing to be a busy August at Brooks River and uh, plenty of bears fishing there right now. So this is live footage from the Brooks Falls camera. Uh, one of the elder bears on the river, number 480 Otis, sitting on the far side. A couple other ones, you know, uh, in the foreground near him. But uh, those aren't the other, the only bears around. We can cut to different cameras throughout our broadcast today to talk about uh, the behavior of the different bears that we'll see. So we'll go to the falls low camera from time to time. And there's a spring cub, a first year cub sitting right in front of the camera right now. So hopefully that cub will stick around uh, because we do want to talk about uh, that cub specifically later on in the broadcast. And we can go a little bit downstream, uh, about 100 yards downstream of the falls to the Riffles Cam to look there for bears. We also have cameras near the mouth of Brooks River, so the lower river camera looking more or less north across the river mouth. And then the River Watch camera looking upstream from that same bridge. And then, uh, you know, it's always a beautiful sight to go underwater and look at the sockeye salmon that are in Brooks River, these salmon are waiting for the right time to spawn. And then uh, if it comes up in our conversation, we might jump up to live footage from Dumpling Mountain. This is about 2,400 feet above Brooks River and maybe about a mile and a half or two straight line distance um, from the river itself. I know that um, there are always uh, new people joining our broadcast. So let's uh, take a quick tour to introduce you to the location of Brooks River in Katmai National Park. It's about 300 miles southwest of Anchorage, Alaska. And Brooks Falls is in, in the west central portion of Katmai. Brooks River is about a mile and a half long and the falls is about at the halfway mark. And along with our webcam partner, ex, uh, the National Park Service, Explore.org hosts and maintains several webcams at Brooks River. The signal from those webcams is sent wirelessly to a couple of radio repeaters up on top of Dumpling Mountain. And then those send the signal wirelessly to the small town of King Salmon, about 30 miles away. Uh, another look at the lower half of Brooks River, the, the uh, latter half of the river itself. So the Brooks Falls camera on the left-hand side at Brooks Falls, and then the locations of our other cameras from time to time. We get different lines of sight using each one of these. The Brooks Falls camera is going to be focused mostly on the few yards of river right in front of the camera itself, but it has the ability to pan downstream from time to time. The Riffles camera looks upstream uh, towards Brooks Falls most of the time. And then our River Watch camera and our lower river camera in these outlines here give us a really great perspective on the lower half of Brooks River. Chris and I also uh, will try to answer a few viewer questions that were submitted in advance. We won't be checking the chats today right now to look for questions. There's a little bit too much or too much for us to concentrate on. However, we do have some uh, questions that were submitted in advance uh, through Ask Your Bear Camp question. And if you want to ask any questions of us for any of our live events, you can find the link to that on the Bear Camp pages on explore.org in the partner tab. And one final thing that I always like to mention at the beginning of the broadcast is the Bears of Brooks River 2022 book. And it's a great way to get to know some of the individual bears at Brooks River. And you can download that for free off of Katmai National Park's website. Chris, it looks like we're taking a look at the far pool here right now. Uh, a couple healthy looking adult male brown bears here. Uh, looks like number 801 in his usual spot. Uh, downstream of the boulders and one of the giants of the river sitting in the far pool there, number 151 Walker. Yeah, 151 is, I think, it ousted Otis from his office. He's been sitting there quite a while. Uh, looks like he was catching a couple of salmon. Someone asked me the other day uh, why they never see them eat red salmon. Well, I think that's just what Walker had and he just made an attempt at another one. 
the bears are certainly going to take what they can catch. Uh, they want the fresher fish because the fresher the fish, the more calories in the fish, the more digestible energy for the bear. But, you know, if all they can get is scraps or uh, dead salmon, then they're going to eat that as well. So th I think the bears up at Brooks Falls are looking for the livelier salmon. It's worth their while, too. You know, when a, sam when a sockeye's freshly, um, you know, arrived from the ocean, it contains probably about 4,500 calories of digestible energy for a brown bear on average. But um, after it spawns, it probably has about half that uh, amount of calories in it, uh, if not less. So, so the bears definitely want to eat um, the fresher fish. And I think that's why we see a lot of the adult males hanging out at Brooks Falls in late summer, Chris, when they could swim downstream like a lot of other bears are doing in um, the lower river area and scavenging salmon uh, down here but those fish are dead. They just don't contain as many calories. So I think the the, bear, the big bears at, at Brooks Falls are just a, being a little bit choosier about their meals. And Mike, there are seem to be plenty of silver still running around, whether they're early uh, early cohos or maybe even uh, late arrivals on the sockeyes. But um, they will eat the red as well. They I think they just prefer the uh, silver, as you said. And while we have Walker in our sights here, let's uh, pull up a question concerning him that was submitted uh, in advance. And somebody was wondering, Walker showed up late uh, this year with some visible new injuries, including a perfect print of claw marks on the left side of his body. We haven't seen him getting in any fights on the camps. Are there any reports of him fighting elsewhere? And I know, Chris, you've been talking to rangers at the river. I haven't heard any reports of Walker or, or of people seeing Walker getting in any fights recently have you heard anything different no in fact when i showed up in uh, early june he already had the one injury and no one knew what happened and recently he showed up with another in just about the same place and no one's witnessed anything nothing on the cam so we're not sure what he's getting into we can't see those injuries on him right now but if he were to stand up and walk you know to the left or the right we would see those injuries on his flanks uh, I, w I wish we knew sort of like the complete story why you know he got those how he got those what was the motivation for you know him getting in a fight maybe he wasn't the aggressor maybe he was defending himself but maybe he was the aggressor and um, you know just uh, walked away with a few wounds because of that Walker's definitely been showing a lot more signs of uh, assertiveness and dominance over the last few years. He was, in his younger days, sort of a happy-go-lucky bear. He would play with a lot of other bears. He seemed to show a high tolerance for other bears, but um, not anymore. He's definitely, you know, a really big guy. He's, you know, at least a thousand pounds right now and, and much more willing to throw his weight around. He has gotten quite immense and uh, he, he has displaced Otis more than once out of his office and um, he does forgive the expression, throw his weight around to try to get his best fishing spots. Yeah, we'll see him in the far pool like he is right against that rock wall from time to time. We we'll also see him on the Little Brooks Falls. He'll wander down to the riffles and especially like uh, when the salmon are first arriving and, and he has like a spot that he likes to sit in the riffles. So as you're looking to identify the individual bears in the river, look at their physical features, but also try to get to know some of their behaviors as well, because that'll help you to determine you know, who's who. And um, besides Walker having sort of like a conical shaped face, that's one of the ways that I identify him. You know, you can also look to some of those fresh wounds on him because those are ephemeral features. You know, they'll be, might be a little bit harder to see next year, but they definitely um, are identifiable right now. And you can, Chris, you can just barely see right now a couple of those scratch marks on his hip. That's true. The other wound on the other side, I think is much larger, but he, you can identify him by these scratches as well. He's had them for quite a bit. 801 in the foreground, um, very focused on anything that's moving in that shallow water there. It's always interesting for me to look at how bears take advantage of the topography of Brooks Falls. 801 is standing in a spot where the in salmon, if there's the salmon are swimming in front of them, they, they can't see the bears. So, He's kind of like in a spot where he can ambush them very easily. And you can see every once in a while, there's a little uh, bit of fin sticking out of the water um, that he takes notice of. But he's being very choosy in the, the salmon that he's, uh, he's chasing. He's not really 
expending a lot of energy there, um, really just waiting for the salmon to, to fall right in front of his face. He is for sure. And we've got uh, 854 Divot on the lip, uh, looking like she's just about catching a couple. Yeah, one of the queens of Brooks Falls on the lip of the waterfall right now, Divot, she is, she's a chubby bear. She's looking really, really good. She does have a wound on her um, right uh, leg. You can kind of see that light spot there, sort of um, almost at her hip, at the top of her leg. Um, but she's doing really well for herself uh, this year. In the right light, as she turns her head the right way, you can see a circular scar around her neck. Um, and that's from a wire trapping snare that was set illegally. And thankfully, we were able to remove it um, in 2014. So she's, um, you know, living her best life at Brooks River and looking really good this year. She's single. She doesn't, she's a female. She doesn't have any cubs this year. But with, uh, you know, with all that body fat, Chris, I would not doubt if Divot comes back with cubs next year. I wouldn't either. I think she's all set for a nice winter. Uh, she's been seen mating with different males. I think one of them might have even been 801. Um, and she's another example of a wound. She showed up with one. No one knows what happened. Um, so, but yeah, she's. I think she's primed and ready. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing if she comes back with a few cubs next year. And in the far pool area, Otis now has sort of like... A snuck his way in there he just sort of like threaded the needle you know I, i'm not going to get too close to walker because i'm not gonna be able to displace him um i'm not going to get too close to 801 because i'm probably not gonna be able to displace him but somehow he found himself in that spot <laughs> and he's immediately rewarded for it so wily old otis here skilled bear he's yeah one of the bears um that i know a lot of people are fond of watching because he is so skilled and there's not a lot of bears that would i don't think try to get in between walker and 801 uh, there's some space to do it you know the um there's probably you know 15 yards in between 801 in the foreground and walker on the far side but again if you're a really big brown bear that's not a whole lot of room no especially not this time of year when they're up pushing you know eight nine hundred pounds even within walker's case maybe a thousand I want to pull up a, a clip here of Otis. Um, this is just a really short one, uh, and it was uh, noted by uh, Charlie Annenberg, who's an Explorador's founder. He's also a, uh, a, a fan of Otis, loves to watch him. And this is, I think, such a fascinating thing. to s I, I was fascinated, at least, to see this, Chris, because you'll see Otis paying very close attention to the water, and it looks like when he catches the fish here, it's almost like the fish swims right over the top of his paw and he just sort of like scoops it up. Like he, he was like that fish was right on the top of his wrist. Um, let's play that again. So you can, everyone can see that once again, but it was like this, the, he felt the salmon swimming right over top of his wrist and he just sort of like pulled it up ever so gently with dexterity. So the fish didn't slide off. That's pretty amazing. Just watching that clip. He just knew that fish was there and pulled it right up. So again, a lot of skill, a lot of dexterity that these bears show um, every time that they are um, catching salmon. And that's something to, to watch for as well. It's not only like their strength and their size, but the other things that they are able to um, accomplish, you know, using um, all their, their skills. Otis is while our, the front. I, I, I thought Otis yeah. was going to try to mis, uh, displace 151, but I guess he's just going to go up by the conveyor belt. I think Otis would have preferred to fish in a different spot. Uh, you know, we don't often see him that close to the boulders when he's given the opportunity to fish elsewhere. But right now, you know, with the, with there's two other big bears, his his options are quite limited. So he fills the gap as as best as he can. While these uh, three bears hang out in the far pool, let's take a look at our first year cub, our spring cub, 
that's sitting on the far side, or oh, excuse me, the near side of Brooks Falls, right below our Brooks Falls low camera. This is number nine tens spring cub and it was born end of uh january early february this year so about eight months old now seven seven to eight months old um growing quite a bit it's it's a pretty large spring cub uh you know could be easily 60 pounds uh at this time of the year since it does seem very well fed mom is nearby chris i think mom is on the lip of brooks falls um, let's cut real quick to the falls camera again, maybe to get a better look. I think that's number nine, 10 on the lip of Brooks Falls. So just kind of leaving her cub on the bank for safekeeping for, for the moment. She does that quite often. A lot of times she'll be up on the fish ladder or, um, she'll go, the, the cub will go up in the tree. So, but I, she seems to really like laying on the shore recently. While we have the cub in sight, there's another question, and this is a common question that we've gotten over the last several days. People have been wondering about um, this cub's health, particularly um, its uh, right front paw seems to be injured. So this is just a representative question of one of the many um, concerning this topic that we've been asked. Nine Ted's cub has a bad front foot. Any ideas what caused it or how bad it might be chris you know i don't think this is another thing i don't think anyone witnessed how uh the cub was injured but it does seem like the cub really isn't any worse for wear at least right now um it seems to be walking on it even though maybe it's favoring that paw just a little bit um you know maybe it's still experiencing a little bit of pain it does seem to be doing um much much better walking on it over the last few days than when we first saw it limping for sure. Uh, when we first noticed her limping, she had it almost upside down. She didn't want to put any weight on it. Uh, people speculated that it was because she fell out of the tree. I, We don't think that's what happened or that's what caused the injury. Uh, so it's another thing we'll just never know. But she definitely has improved over the last couple of days um, and seems to be moving around quite well. She was actually seen with her mom up by uh, the housing development that we stay in uh, up almost to Brooks Lake. So she, she's moving around pretty well. Yeah, and that's probably, you know, uh, about a half mile walk, maybe a little bit less. But, uh, you know, bears, of course, don't always follow straight lines. And if, if a bear did try to walk straight line distance to that housing area from Brooks Falls, it would be kind of a, a rough walk because of all the, the down trees and dead trees in the forest. Um, so likely covering a little bit uh, greater ground. And Chris, you mentioned the um, the cub walking, um, you know, and looked uh, pretty bad uh, when we first saw the cub limping. So let's bring up a clip of that to show people uh, what that looked like if you hadn't seen it before. And then we also have several other clips of how the cub sort of progressively got better and better at walking on that foot over the last several days. So this is when we first saw the cub limping this is from the 22nd of august so just three days ago actually and i think it looks a lot worse than it is because it just doesn't want to turn its paw over and place any weight on that right front paw it's almost it's the the cub just sort of turned it over and is walking on its wrist which has <laughs> got to be uncomfortable um but it, you know when i looked at it at first i was like oh boy does it have like some sort of a, a broken paw or sprain and i I don't think so. I think it was just because it didn't want to place any weight on the bottom of, of that paw. I agree. I thought the same thing when I saw it. I thought maybe she'd sprained it or um, had even broken something. Um, but she's definitely walking much better, and I don't think that's the case. And this is from the same day, um, not that long afterwards, uh, we after we captured uh footage the footage that you just saw so this is the same cub 910 spring cub resting um uh, above brooks falls while mother fishes i'm going to skip ahead here just a little bit because it gets off of the the uh the top of the falls and then it climbs a tree and it does it pretty well so so the same day you know with that injured paw 
able to climb a spruce tree like it has done all summer, indicating that the injury wasn't that severe. If there was really, a, I think, a significant injury to that foot or that leg, I don't think we would be seeing that cub climbing a tree. However, you know, stranger things have happened. Bears are really tough animals. They're extremely resilient. So they can do a lot of things under quite a lot of pain or when they experience quite a lot of pain. Then, um, let's see, the next day or the day after, this is the day after actually. So um, this is the 23rd of August. So um, just, uh, just two days ago, the cub limping just a little bit, but not nearly as bad as just the, the couple of days beforehand. Yeah, she's definitely improving. So we're optimistic that it's, you know, if, if it's a cut, maybe it's healing well. Um, she's definitely putting weight on it. She's moving well. Again, if she's up on the way to Brooks Lake, that's, um, that's encouraging. So, uh, yes, I, I hope that answers, you know, sort of everyone's questions. We don't know how it was injured, I, but, you know, given the progress that the cub has made, just kind of sort of placing weight on the paw over the last couple of days, I don't think it's um, any anything serious or anything that the, the cub can't recover from. Um, good view here. Uh, interesting one of the, the cub just sitting on the near bank right below the falls platform. And then mother is on the river um on the upper right hand side of the, of the screen, trying to catch fish in one of her favorite fishing spots. Let's head downstream here for just a moment. We'll try to catch sight. Whoop, there it goes, just out of our line of sight, <laughs> swimming under the bridge. There was a bear snorkeling uh, fairly close to um, the camera not that not that long ago. Um, the underwater camera, Chris, I always like to check when bears are swimming underneath the bridge because every once in a while we'll see a bear swimming underneath the underwater camera. Uh, the sockeye salmon down here are staging for the right time to spawn. These fish likely won't be trying to jump Brooks Falls. They'll be going upstream, upstream. and spawning in the, you know, the Riffley areas of the river downstream of Brooks Falls. There's a lot of great spawning habitat downstream of Brooks Falls, especially in the few hundred yards downstream of Brooks Falls. So that's what these fish are really waiting for. And we'll give this another, another 30 seconds or so maybe to see whether um, that bear decides to swim close to the camera or not. You know, Mike, I've actually seen them spawn right at the bridge as well. So they could just be staging. They could just be waiting for the right time. Um, like you said, maybe not even trying to get to the falls at this point, just hanging out, just waiting for the right time. Water temperature really has a big influence on when salmon are spawning. So if the water's too warm, then their eggs will incubate probably too quickly, hatch at the wrong time. So really, they're kind of looking for a Goldilocks set of conditions. The uh, cold water temperatures are ideal for their spawning. It's better for their um, their own their own bodies, the energy conservation uh, and efficiency that they need. Oh, and it looks like the salmon are scattering, so maybe that bear is kind of close. It's a good sign that he's coming if they're scattering. But yeah, the salmon are primed for cold water conditions, and since. Brooks River is fed by shallow water in Lake Brooks. It tends to be a, a little bit warmer than like a spring fed stream or a, or a stream that's fed by snowmelt um, in the headwaters of the Lake Brooks watershed. So salmon spawning happens a little bit later in Brooks River compared to what we have in, um, in the other watersheds uh, farther upstream. And it looks like a couple of bears um, searching the lower river right now, Chris, for um, any salmon that maybe have already spawned, but certainly any salmon that can't swim away. That's true. Downstream, they, uh, a lot of sub-adults, a lot of family groups are going to hang out down there and wait on either scraps or the dead and dying fish that are so much easier to catch than they are at the falls. Fishing down here is only going to become easier as we progress 
into September and early October. The peak of the sockeye salmon spawning period in Brooks River is September. It's beginning now. So bear, or bears are finding some spawned out um, sockeye, but not as many as what they'll find later in, in summer. So right around you know the middle of September, there's going to be the, the whole river bottom is sort of littered with fish parts, either like whole dead salmon or partially eaten salmon. And I can remember times standing on the platform at the mouth of the river and watching bears cruise up and down the river and counting how many salmon the bears are eating and, and they can catch and eat sometimes a dozen fish in a half hour just by cruising the, the river looking for looking for dead fish so maybe it's not the most appetizing meal that they can find but it can be quite lucrative and i think mike that is the reason why we see bears return to the river in september maybe they've gone off wandering looking for other fishing spots in august but there is so many fish and fish parts around in the river that are easy pickings that I think that's the reason a lot of them do return. And this is uncommon this for is un what you find in salmon streams, you know, throughout Katmai National Park and, and throughout, you know, much of Alaska and North America, there aren't many places that offer bears, you know, sort of like two periods of time to fish for salmon. And bears come to Brooks River in early summer to fish for the, the first waves of migrating salmon, but they can stay here practically all summer, as we've seen, to fish for uh, dead and dying salmon late in the summer. And there's not a lot of places that provide bears with that opportunity. And in fact, I'm not aware of any place anywhere that provides bears with this chance to fish for salmon at a single place all summer. Uh, so maybe different streams in different areas might have like different waves of salmon or different species coming in. Like some might come in early summer and might come in um, and then they'll spawn and then they're done. And then maybe there's another wave that comes in late summer and then it's they spawn and then they're done. But you know, bears can really sit at Brooks Falls as we've been seeing over the last several years from the, practically the middle of June until, um, you know, the end of October uh, waiting for salmon to come to them. So this is a, really a, a special spot in, in many ways. It truly is. It's, it's really a magical place between the salmon and the bears um, and all the rest of the animals in the ecosystem. It's pretty uh, unusual to have the bears as close together, to have so many uh, salmon, the salmon run come in like it does. Uh, it's one of the best salmon runs in the world. But the bears can take advantage of it. The ecosystem benefits from the salmon. So uh, we're pretty lucky to have all of it um, and with that we're able to share it on the cams with people. And if you're just tuning into our broadcast, thanks for joining us today. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. We're looking at live footage of brown bears fishing for salmon at world famous Brooks Falls in Katmai National Park. And joining me for this play-by-play -play is my co-host, park ranger, Chris Kleesrath. Uh, not too much shuffling, it looks like, at the waterfall over the first half hour of our, uh, of our program today, Chris. Um, still have Otis and 151 up there uh, against the far wall, 801. Um, other bears on the lip. And, you know, at this time of the year, we don't see nearly as much jostling at Brooks Falls as we see earlier in the summer. I think the bears are really well fed and they're also, you know, uh, very familiar with one another. So they don't have to sort of settle disputes in the same way or the same frequency that they did earlier in the year because they know each other so well. And a look at Divot right here. Uh, she's looking good, Mike. Very round bear, great thick fur coat. And I'm sorry, I think I've interrupted you, Chris. That's okay. I was just going to say she was up on the lip when we started and apparently she's gone to see if there's some uh, better fishing down beneath the falls. If it's a bear that we'll see fishing at Brooks Falls as well as at the river mouth. She is one of those bears that definitely alters her behavior depending on the age of her offspring or whether she has offspring. I can't remember an instance of her coming to Brooks Falls when she has first year cubs. She usually avoids the waterfall at that time or 
at that point in her sort of her reproductive cycle, probably to give her cubs a greater level of security. But when she's a single girl, as she is this summer, she's definitely going to to um, take advantage of that that freedom in a sense, where she doesn't have to worry about you know protecting um, vulnerable cubs. She can come to the waterfall and and really just um, kind of concentrate on her on her own body and her own health. She's definitely taken advantage of being single this year, Mike. So she's sticking her face in the water frequently, just looking again for anything that can't swim away. She could try to chase salmon downstream in the falls, just like bears at the, the mouth of the river could try to chase salmon, but we don't see bears doing that all that often in these locations at this time of the year because bears are smart animals. They know that you know chasing fish in deep water where the fish have a lot of escape routes is kind of a futile exercise. They may have learned that from experience. They may have learned that from by watching other bears or they just might sort of like conceptualize it or intuit it um, in their brains in, in some way. But they know that it's um, it's not worth their while. So they're uh, you know when it di when Divot is waiting for fish to come to her, she's standing on the lip of the falls or standing in some other place. Um, she's practicing good energy economics. I think fishing downstream down by the bridge has been a little more difficult this year, considering um, that the water has been a little higher than usual. So I'm not surprised to see her up here, uh, where she can see the fish a little better. Uh, and grab them as they swim by. Seems like the weather is changing quite quickly. Uh, at the beginning of our broadcast, I don't think it was very windy, but it's it's starting to get quite windy uh, on the lower river. Um, you can notice the, the wind picking up, blowing the grass. You can hear a little bit of wind noise in our cameras sometimes. Up on Dumpling Mountain, the camera is shaking quite a bit. So, uh, you know, weather patterns uh, you know change quickly in Katmai, and people say that about everywhere, basically everywhere that I have lived, and I've worked in nine national parks, people will say, oh, if you want the weather to change, just wait five minutes. Um, but that, it doesn't seem particularly true in, uh, in Katmai and on the Alaska Peninsula, because it is in between two pretty uh, large bodies of water, the, um, uh, the North Pacific Ocean, uh, and that's going to be the blue area on the right side of this Google Earth image. And then the Bering Sea in Bristol Bay on the left side of the image. So when you get those two, uh, you know, water bodies uh, with different water temperatures, different weather patterns, and all that stuff sort of colliding over the Alaska Peninsula, it can really make for some ferocious weather in the Katmai region. And of course, that's one reason why when I was ever boating in Katmai, I was also I was I was always very. Uh, careful to check the weather forecast and I, I especially like in a kayak or a canoe I never really wanted to stray very far from shore because it can be uh, you know quite dangerous out on the lakes when the winds pick up it really can we took a uh, skip out to Margo Falls a couple weeks ago and it seemed fine when we left but the, the wind picked up so quickly that we had to cut our trip short and it was an interesting ride back A lot of times people wonder about, as we watch uh, nine, ten cubs sort of disappear into the trees here, uh, a lot of times people wonder about, like, how safe is it to go to Katmai? Can I visit there safely? What about the bears, for instance? And, you know, bears certainly need to be respected. They are powerful animals. They're strong animals. They have the potential to injure people. Um, but the bears, statistically speaking, are not the most dangerous thing in the park. It's, it's definitely going to be like strong winds and cold water. So if you're in a boat, for instance, and your boat gets swamped during windy conditions, the lakes are very, very cold. Like Naknek Lake, it is uh, fed by glaciers. So it's extremely cold year round. Um, and then also, um, you know, small planes uh, often don't do so well uh, in, in, you know, very windy conditions like this. So plane crashes, and, and cold water and drowning really are um, not necessarily in combination, but sometimes, unfortunately. But those really are, you know, statistically the most dangerous things in the park. You have to respect the bears um, 
and their space. But I also, anytime I was, you know, ever flying in the park, I made sure to know very carefully about um, how to operate emergency, the, the doors on the small planes and, um, and being very careful about, you know, uh, just taking maybe some of those extra precautions that they may help um, to save you in the event of an emergency. Yeah, I think, you know, we set up the orientation to give people an idea how to respect the bare space and uh, keep themselves in the least amount of danger possible. Um, but there's really, with the weather and the wind and even the rain sometimes, um, that causes a lot more problems than you would think. Um, if you know, Mike, if you were trying to get to King Salmon for anything, um, you always have to plan a couple of days in advance because they will cancel boats and planes uh, that were scheduled to take you in if it's not safe. That's right. And, and pilots and boat captains, they're going to be erring on the side of caution a lot of times. So if you do plan a trip to Brooks River, try to budget in a little bit of wiggle room um, as much as you can really afford, um, just in case there happen to be um, weather delays. So expect that sort of thing. Bring, you know, some warm weather clothing, some good, um, you know, rain jackets and things like that. Some of the, my best bear, bear viewing memories have been during really terrible weather. What most people would consider terrible weather, pouring down rain, strong winds. And a lot of times the bears are gonna keep on going at Brooks Falls. They're, um, they're not gonna care. <laughs> so I, um, I enjoy those, uh, those days sometimes because you might have a little bit more space on the wildlife viewing platforms and not have to elbow your way in to um, a crowded platform itself. I agree 100%. Go ahead, Mike. And, and, and speaking of that, Chris, sorry to interrupt. Um, it brings up another viewer question that somebody was wondering. Uh, somebody was uh, asked, do bears ever get cold? And can they freeze to death? You know, bears are warm-blooded animals just like us, but they seem to have, you know, adaptations that really help them to tolerate cold water and cold weather much much better than we could we are you know humans essentially chris are, are a species uh, that is adapted for the tropics you know if we were naked the only place that we could really survive is in a place where the temperatures really don't drop um you know very um you know very far towards towards freezing uh, because we don't have a lot of fur to keep us warm often we don't have a lot of body fat to insulate us from cold water but bears do really really well for themselves in cold water. And we've even seen bears fishing in snowstorms when the water is probably in its in, in the 30s and the air temperature is much, much lower than that. They seem to do just fine. And I'm sure it's a combination of the thick fur and the layers of fat they have. Um, and let's face it, they're packing on as much weight as they can to make it through the winter. And usually they're digging their dens uh, so that there's safer from the winds and any of the inclement weather and the temps uh, that will would actually hurt them. Bears are working towards, you know, gaining enough body fat to survive winter hibernation. And, you know, it's really not the, the cold weather that they're avoiding when they go into hibernation. When they go to the den in November, Typically in Katmai, they're not doing it to avoid cold weather. What they're doing is avoiding famine uh, because there's just not a lot, of, a lot for them to eat in wintertime. So really what they're doing is they're just kind of sequestering a year's worth of energy, you know, or a winter's worth of energy in their bodies through body fat. And that's what they're doing in the, in the winter. Uh, getting back to that question, though, you know, kind of a follow up or, or part two of the question was, can they freeze to death? I'm sure they can, you know, given the right, given the right circumstances, but they are very tolerant of cold weather um, and in cold conditions. Polar bears, in fact, evolved from uh, brown bears. So um, brown bears, you know, have, you know, adaptations to tolerate cold weather, not nearly as well as polar bears, which are basically the Arctic bear, but they can, you know, they can do it quite well. And that doesn't mean they like to be in cold water all the time. We often see a lot of these um, young bears, uh, you know, standing or sitting on rocks like um, this um, nine tens Spring cub right here with mom walking in front.
She does seem to be favoring the paw a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit there. Um, not, you know, leaning on that right front foot. Um, in, in a sense, and this is always something interesting for me to think about, they walk on all four legs, but they, you know, if, when you, if you were to look at the bones in a bear's, um, uh, you know, front arms, I mean, they're, they essentially are, are the same as ours, just modified in a different way so they can walk on all fours. So they don't have, um, you know, knees uh, on all four legs. That's so kind of like a myth. I think a lot of people think about, um, you know, mammals when they're walking on all fours, they'll be like, oh, well, they have four knees. They don't, you know, of, it, they'll have wrists and they have elbows just like we do. They have knees um, on their, their hind legs. But when we say bears walking on all four legs, I mean, they do in a sense have four legs, but the bones in their, um, in their, their um, rear legs and in their, their front arms are essentially the same as ours. They're just modified in a way that allows them to walk um, on all fours, but they do walk flat footed like us. So that, that is um, one similarity that we share with brown bears. It's a little quiet downstream of uh, Brooks Falls down at the river mouth right now. But Chris, there was one uh, clip I think that we did want to talk about. And I think this, um, while things are kind of stable up at Brooks Falls, uh, actually two clips that we can maybe talk about right now. One has to do with a peculiar behavior that we see bears sometimes do um, at the mouth of Brooks River. And sometimes, you know, they're often searching for salmon down here. But this clip um, from a couple of days ago is a bear that is looking for fish, but it also is gonna consume something much different. And it's um, a bit unexpected. You wouldn't expect bears to eat um, clay or earth, but this bear is gonna dig some up here and, and do just that. This is a behavior that we see uh, brown bears doing occasionally in this spot of Brooks River. It seems like they know that they can access a good hunk of clay and just sort of, sort of munch away at that. And Chris, um, you know, from what I've been reading, and you can, um, you know, contradict me if I'm wrong or if you've read something different, but from what I've reading, bears are going to eat clay or sometimes eat earth um, because it could be sort of like, or it could act like a, uh, or have some anti diarrheal properties. Uh, I don't think scientists really know that for sure, but well, we do see bears, um, especially later in the year, eating clay. And that's just a giant hunk that this bear um, pulls up. So I don't like, I don't know if it likes the chalky taste of, of clay, but uh, you know, it, it seems like it, it, right, it feels the need to, to eat some, and that might help sort of like settle some of its, um, you know, some of its runny stool that it experiences when it's on a, that raw salmon diet. It's possible. The paper that we were reading earlier did speculate it could be to get nutrients they're missing, or it was noted that they did eat clay, especially after consuming large amounts of fish or uh, mammals, other mammals. Um, so what you're saying is possible, you know, like a good explanation. Um, it could settle their stomach. It could have anti-diarrheal properties. Um, let's face it, it could just be that it tastes good to them. This isn't the only bear that does it. We'll see bears doing this in this spot every once in a while. Um, in fact, this, this is a clip from September last year. Not the same bear, I don't think, but a bear in the same fish, fishing spot, basically, or clay eating spot doing um, this the same thing. So uh, bears, yeah, will frequently seek out, um, you know, clay for maybe a variety of reasons. There might not be just one reason, but they, they certainly do it. And um, to give people a better idea of what that looks like, this is a photo of um, uh, an archaeological excavation um, near the Brooks Camp Visitor Center that was done. Chris, this is actually where the, the uh, vault toilets are located. So this is when they were building those vault toilets. Um, that really thick layer of gray colored earth 
near the top is ash from the 1912 eruption of Nova Erupta. In the Brooks River area, it's maybe six to eight inches deep. There's other ash layers farther down, and that those help to serve as markers in the archaeological record. Uh, but the bears are looking for clay uh, that that 1912 layer of ash uh, at the near the the top of the soil horizon. Chris, I don't know if you've actually felt that. You probably have, but can you describe um, the the texture of that ash? You know, at, at Brooks River. Um, I felt it once or twice and it's kind of, um, it was felt like a fine, like a finer clay to me than, uh, other clays I felt. I don't know if that's from the ash or, um, not as gritty as some of the other clays that I've felt. And it varies in, I think in, in consistency, but it's, um, you know, the ash that fell at Brooks river was pretty fine. Brooks river was upwind of the eruption. So not as much ash fell there compared to areas downwind. Part, uh, parts of the Pacific coast of Katmai that are in equivalent distance away from the eruptive center of the 1912 eruption, so about 30 miles or so, some of those places got up to, uh, near a meter of ash falling on them. Um, so that was, you know, Brooks River is a bit lucky that it was just upwind um, at, at that time. And I do think it certainly helps to solidify the bear's um, scat and stool um, because it can be quite thin and runny and uh, for lack of a better word, it is diarrhea when they're eating a lot of um, fresh salmon. Uh, but this is some clay filled scat that I found at the river a few years ago. Not my hand in there for scale, someone else's um, holding it above above the scat. But I think I do think it serves to help solidify things. Um, so if you were wondering why bears, um, you know, happen to eat earth like that, then um, I think there's some some ideas that scientists have, but they're not quite sure overall. Back to live footage here of Brooks Falls, 910's spring cub still star of the show being as cute as ever, hanging out on that boulder downstream while mom fishes elsewhere. I think on the lip of the falls though, 910 is not there anymore. It looks like Divot is back on the lip of the falls. So um, mother bear of our spring cub here is off wandering around somewhere else, probably close by though. They often don't leave their cubs uh, and walk too far away, but sometimes they will, Chris. It's sometimes uh, you know interesting to see how mother bears might sort of cache their cubs up in a tree. They'll signal them to climb a tree and just sort of stay there. And um, sometimes they'll go far away and leave their cubs there for, um, you know, an hour or more. Yeah, we've seen 435 do that with cubs in camp before. I think 171 has done it. Um, 910, 910's cub here spends a lot of time in that tree to the left of the fish ladder. Uh, I think that the mom likes her up there where she can keep an eye on her. On the far side of the falls, 801 at uh, at center, 480 Otis on the left, 151 Walker still on the far side. I haven't seen them. I've been trying to you know keep an eye on all the webcams during a broadcast, Chris, and I haven't seen them catching too many salmon over the last um, 45 minutes or so. So I think uh, you know to me this really illustrates like, uh, once again just how patient um, these bears can be. I haven't seen any fish jumping at all. Uh, I think the fish are staging downstream, but I don't think they're going to make it up this far. We saw a couple jumping for eight by four before, uh, but I don't think there's a whole lot right there right now. And that's not unexpected for you know this time of the year. The the sockeye migration has essentially ended. The the sockeye are looking for really like the right place to spawn, but there are lesser numbers of coho salmon. Sometimes you'll hear them called silver salmon. They'll move into Brooks River at this time of the year. Some of those will spawn upstream of the falls, so they'll be jumping uh, the waterfall. And if a bear catches a salmon that's not red right now, I think it's a silver salmon. I think those are just some of those fish that are fresh arrived from the ocean. And the 
the coho salmon are bigger than the sockeye overall. So they can really uh, provide bears with a, a huge caloric reward. If you catch a 12 pound, a 15 pound silver salmon, that I don't know the, uh, I don't, I haven't seen the numbers that of digestible energy that that might that fish might contain for a brown bear, but if it's double the size of a sockeye, I don't think it'd be unreasonable to say that you know, a, you know, a ten pound uh, coho salmon could contain something like you know, uh, close to nine thousand calories. So uh, you know, a, 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 if a bear catches those fish, they really can um, be rewarded with a lot of energy. If I'm not mistaken, I believe it was a silver that Otis caught not too long ago that they showed on film. Yeah, for our viewers at home, I th that might be something interesting for you to watch for. When the cameras are giving us, you know, an up close view of the bears fishing right now, if you see like Walker 801 in this, from this perspective, catching a fish, uh, you can easily determine the species by looking at the color of it. So uh, if, you, if it's bright red, it's going to be a sockeye salmon. If it's silver in color, it's probably going to be a coho salmon. But the cohos will be shifting into their spawning colors very soon. Um, and when that happens, they have sort of greenish backs and pink sides. So you can still differentiate them from the sockeye. They're actually very beautiful fish if you get a good look at them. But you, know, you can, you know, kind of, uh, you know, do some observations and see what the bears are catching primarily at Brooks Falls at this time of the year. And I think as we transition into September, it's going to be more and more of those coho salmon and fewer and fewer of the sockeye. Yeah, if you look, think of what we just saw on the underwater cam, those were sockeyes and they're mostly, mostly red. And uh, let's uh, look back to Brooks Falls here. I was trying to get a glimpse of the uh, the salmon that looked like maybe, maybe that was 910. I'm not sure, uh, had caught, but I didn't get a great look at it. Um, unfortunately. So if you're watching at home, maybe you can watch the replay and see what that fish happened uh, to be. The spring cub right now moving off of uh, the boulder, moving towards the near bank. I think she saw her mother catch a fish and she's going in for some. And getting back to our conversation that we had about the, the cub earlier and that, that hurt paw, um, looking to be moving uh, pretty well on it right now. Maybe it's still a little bit gingerly uh, walking on that right front paw, but seems to be doing pretty well. Mother bear on the near bank now with its um, with her catch. And Chris, this is also always sort of interesting to um, to see if um, you know a mother allows her cub to take any fish from her. They really, I wouldn't say that mother bears share their fish with their cub. It's almost like they merely tolerate their cub taking you know a fish away from them and i guess in that sense it is sharing um but they don't really bring fish to their cub it's not like a mother bird bringing uh insects to a baby bird in a nest they sort of just like kind of leave the leftovers for um for their cub yeah it looks like he's finishing oh she's finishing off whatever mom just left her and divot just caught a silver on the on the lip. I think from here it looks like it's silver. Yeah, it definitely does. There's also um, some pink salmon that utilize Brooks River for spawning, some some chum salmon that utilize Brooks River for spawning, but those uh, fish usually spawn a little bit earlier in the year, at least the pink salmon do. So that probably isn't a pink salmon, could be a chum salmon, but um, often by this time of the year, they're in their spawning colors as well. Let's head up to the falls camera, maybe get a better look at Sam or uh, Divot eating that fish. Certainly a fish that has not spawned. You can see how bright red that flesh is. Thanks to our camera operators for giving us all of these great views today. When a salmon has spawned, those pigments are transferred out to the skin, transferred to the eggs. So the, the flesh of a spawned out salmon is much Paler. It's almost, it's not even pink at all. It's, it's basically white. So this is a fish that certainly has not spawned. Look how well you can see the ring around her neck at this point. 
yeah, when she bends over the right way, that, that mm -hmm. scar is quite visible. Bears are resilient animals. They're so tough overall. And we just have a, a few minutes left on our broadcast here, Chris. There's, and speaking of, you know, resiliency and toughness and what they have to deal with and hardships they have to deal with, I think there's one more clip that uh, we wanted to talk about before we conclude today. And that happens to be uh, the cousin of 910 Spring Cub, 909's yearling, with some porcupine quills in its muzzle. And we get to see a little bit of that in this clip as um, the yearling is playing with mom. And mom, <laughs> at the beginning of this clip, being a little bit rough with her cub, um, you know, biting the, the nape of the cub's neck and wrestling. But these bears are having a good time despite the yearling having some porcupine quills in its uh, in its muzzle, right, basically at the tip of its nose. And we've seen bears with that before, and they they work their way out, and they're fine. But it, I would imagine it's pretty painful. If you recall, in twenty twenty, it was what three fives cub that um, got them in her paw, and so she dealt with that for almost the whole summer. In fact, we have a, a picture of that. So let me bring that up here. Um, this is, uh, yeah, 435 spring cub with the porcupine quills in its paw. Uh, this is um, pretty pretty zoomed in. So, uh, you know, maybe it's not as clear if you haven't seen this before, but the, the paw is, you know, kind of below the cub, of course, on um, from my perspective on the left-hand side of the cub itself and you can see like kind of the white thing sticking out of the paw those are the porcupine quills this bear healed from the injury quite quite well it's an independent bear on the river um, this year so um, it healed from that um, the same year uh, 719 who's actually the daughter of holly so this is um holly's um grand bear um from from 2020 um, one of one of 719's yearlings had porcupine quills in its muzzle. And this bear was also healed uh, from those injuries and successfully weaned. Um, I'm not sure which one this was. Um, you know, it's maybe number, uh, the bear that we identify now is 207 or 208. Um, and thanks to um, River PA uh, for providing us with um, this photo. So longtime bear cam watcher. For that yeah um you know porcupine quills are one of those things chris that bears uh young bears especially seem to um you know learn a lesson from and, and they're unlikely to repeat um you know uh, that mistake i agree they seem to give them a wide berth after they acquire a few quills in their nose or their paws so i would expect um 909's yearling to heal from those injuries. A couple other things about uh, porcupine quills real quick before we conclude, <coughs> excuse me, is that um, they have some antimicrobial properties to them, probably because porcupines accidentally stick themselves with their own quills from time to time, like if they fall out of a tree, for instance. Um, so that can happen. Um, and they do continue to sort of work their way through flesh, um, you know, under the right circumstances. Uh, because they are barbed um, but and they can cause infection from time to time but given you know the toughness of bears the ability of bears to heal from significant injury and the fact that we've seen bears healing from porcupine quills even in their muzzles before i think um you know that's that um yearling will do um quite well over time even though it might be experiencing pain from those quills at this moment as we conclude our broadcast here, Chris, um, we're looking at number 910 on the lip of the falls, getting rewarded once again for her patience and skill. Uh, anything that stuck out to you during our last hour of talking? Just the resiliency of these bears between the injuries on 151, on 854, for the cubs with the porcupine quills and the, and the cuts on the foot, it's, they're all going to be fine. We don't, in some cases, we don't, know, we know where the porcupine things came from, but um, the cuts and bruises and uh, we'll never know exactly what happened, but they seem to be very resilient and uh, move on from these injuries fairly quickly. Yeah, well said, 
virtually every bear that we see on the river has experienced significant hardship in its life. And that's going to be a, a continuing story for a lot of these bears. And I think it's one of the things that makes the bear watching experience at Brooks River special because we can see how they persevere through, um, you know, a lot of these hardships uh, during their lives, whether that's uh, a spring cub with an injured paw or a yearling with porcupine quills in its muzzle or some of the wounds that we see on the older bears. Chris, thanks so much for joining me today. It's been a fun broadcast and um, I think we're going to do this again next week. Okay. And thanks for having me. I've enjoyed it and uh, hope everyone has a great weekend. That was park ranger Chris Cleesrath from Katmai National Park. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. Thanks for joining us on this play-by-play -play broadcast. We'll be back next week, same bear time, same bear channel to talk more brown bears and salmon during our next play-by-play. -play. Until then, uh, have a great day, everybody, and enjoy the bears. <laughs>